So this is just a tutorial on doing um, more complex molecular scale systems. Um, it's designed to be like a more advanced tutorial. Like up on the wiki, we have stuff for like uh, sodium chloride using Gromax and Amber. Um, <clears throat> this tutorial in particular does use Gromax, but uh, we'll be going over it in as dynamics agnostic as way as possible, in, in as much as that can be done. So um, it's going to be very code heavy. So um, <clears throat> Right, so just a brief overview of what we're going to be doing. We'll just be going over like the general structure of the tutorial, um, as well as like where you can, you know, clone, get the, you know, the actual tutorial files, as well as what the system will be, and then um, <coughs> we're looking over all of the major weighted ensemble files, how they're structured, what all of the lines are doing. Um, <coughs> the overall purpose is so that you can kind of gain an intimate understanding of like how the actual files that you set up and, and what they do. And the idea is to get you from, you know, a very basic understanding of everything to where you can set up much more complex systems. As well, um, <clears throat> in the upcoming release, and if you go to the, like, uh, West Tools repo, you'll, you can clone the, download the latest version. You can see there are some new options that simplify how you can actually bin things that may make your life easier. Um, so I want to go over those as well. <clears throat> um, as well, Dan and, and Lillian earlier in the day talked about using... Um, binning on color as well, and that requires currently the use of a custom progress coordinate loader, so I'll be going over that. Um, <clears throat> so here's where you want to go, or so as well, this, um, there's a wiki component to this tutorial, so everything I talk about today is, is uh, done in excruciating detail here, so um, <laughs> and if, I, if, I miss, if I miss anything in this talk, it'll be, it'll be there later, which that's available from the front page. So given that Rory's simulation is still running, um, <coughs> definitely go, you want to go onto Frank and, and absolutely go into your home folder and then do this particular step, but uh, do not initialize the system, you do not initialize or submit the system. So we'll just leave this last step out. So I'll just wait until you all have the uh, system clones and uh, right, we'll follow along from there once you're done. Just wait until the sounds of typing have finished. And, um, <clears throat> In particular, for this tutorial, if you have any questions along the way about anything, just go ahead and interrupt and ask. There's a lot fewer shell scripts in this one. There are a lot of shell scripts in this one. Oh, you split a directory? Yes. Yeah, so this is, um, have you, if you followed along with any of the tutorials, this has the exact same directory setup as those. So does anybody not have... Is anybody still in the cloning process? Everybody seems to be a fast typist. Okay, moving on. So what does W init do? Um, that'll initialize the system. That creates a simulation. That creates that starts the simulation. It's like setting up your. That'll create the West. So that'll create the uh, West .h5 file, uh -huh. basically, and that'll also create the basis states. Or that'll excuse me. That'll create the initial states from the basis the states. Structure. Yeah, that'll create the directory structure. I'll go over it in a second, actually. W, so. w init will not create the directory. W init will not, excuse me, W init will not create the basis structure, but init.sh. So just first up, a little bit about our tutorial system. So um, in particular, we've picked the P53 peptide fragment for this system, which is a tumor suppressor, which is regulated by the MDM2 oncoprotein. It's a common research target due to its uh, involvement, in, it's a common experimental research target due to its involvement in tumor suppression, which is why you might want to simulate a target like this. Um, <clears throat> we're only simulating a 14 residue fragment, and this movie isn't flying very smoothly. So it's relatively simple to simulate, like relative to other such proteins. Um, <clears throat> This is an equilibrium weighted ensemble simulation, so we won't be um, <clears throat> we won't have any target states in the initialization step. Um, we want to sample a conformation. We want to sample the peptide conformation. So we've selected uh, a two-dimensional progress coordinate to encourage that conformational sampling. Um, in particular, we're just doing a heavy atom RMSD of the peptide, 
as a line on itself as well as color. We'll talk a little bit more about that selection. There's also a third progress coordinate we could have picked, um, which we're returning as auxiliary data. <coughs> Um, in general, this, is already, this was already brought up earlier, but weighted ensemble does require a stochastic element, which we're implementing as a thermostat. Um, we use a weak thermostat and a weak barostat. Uh, in this case, we're using a stochastic velocity rescaling thermostat, which uh, that's only available in Gromax, to my knowledge. You could use the launch, a weak Langevin thermostat. That's available in pretty much every molecular dynamics engine. So, um, <clears throat> moving on to the meat of the tutorial, so to speak, the WESPA files. So, to start with, you run init.sh, which is just mostly a shell wrapper designed to simplify your life in terms of running w init. <clears throat> so first, you pull in your env.sh. Um, if you're running this on your, if you decide not to run this on a cluster, um, the first part of this script just kills any running WESPA simulation. This is designed to minimize conflict with anything which that just pulls in any running WESPA process and kills it. Um, you have to be careful. If you're deciding to really, really kill whatever little computer you're running on, that'll kill any other simulation you have as well. <coughs> this is what creates your directory structure. So you blow away. First, you move any other, um, you move the remaining parts of any other simulation, so trash segs, seg logs, and I states. And then you get rid of them. <coughs> And then you create the directories for the new simulation. Could I clarify something? Yes. Yeah, so um, init.sh sets up the directory structure for your simulation, as Adam announced. And so what's going, what's going on here, that directory structure, these trajectory segment data is in this trash set directory. The log files from your MD engine are in the seg logs directory. And your initial starting points for all your trajectories are in this ISAPES. Directory. These are all created through simulation runs, and so what's, what he's saying about getting them out of the way is, okay, we're starting a new simulation, let's blow away anything that was there before. Right. Exactly. So it goes without saying, do not run this on the uh, directory. Yeah. Do not write. Don't initialize a simulation unless you intend <laughs> to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> So the next step, we actually initialize the simulation. The first state is we say, okay, what are our basis states? So um, the B state arc says we're going to initialize our basis states from a file called just basis states in this case. It's not, it's not too complicated. And I don't go into basis states in detail here, but we're just starting from one basis state file, which is just P53 folded into its um, <coughs> bound state. And you can take a look at basis states if you want. It just says, it just points to the uh, file in the directory structure, and it says what the relative probability is, which is one in this case. And um, <clears throat> that refers to the probability that weighted ensemble is going to pull it relative to all of the other basis states we have. And then it gives it some internal tag, some internal reference, basically. And again, uh, it's, this isn't a steady state simulation, it's an equilibrium simulation, so we don't have any target bins. So. <clears throat> Um, then we actually run w init. Um, we give it the B state args. As it's an equilibrium simulation, we're never going to pull, this is the only time we're going to pull any initial states, so we only need to create one segment per state. If you're running a steady state simulation, you might want to create more initial states from your basis state, um, because you're going to actually run through more of your initial states. Um, <clears throat> When you're actually running a, a West, or excuse me, when you're actually running a weighted ensemble simulation, and you start using up your, um, you start using your initial states in the steady state simulation, you'll generate them on the fly. It's just an a matter of efficiency whether you generate them now or when you're running on, like, say, a cluster, and you have to generate them when you're using up CPU time. So it can save you a little bit of, you know, your your allocation, basically. Um, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what's going on here is that the basis states are the, the fixed states that you draw initial structures from for your simulation. So if you had more than one initial structure that you wanted to seed your simulations from, you'd have more than one basis state, corresponding more than one, in this case, Gromax structure that says what starting structure you want to have. So we only have one starting structure, we only have one basis state. Now, when the simulation runs, it's going to take those basis states and basically copy
copy them into what are called initial states. The reason that this exists is what if you're running a simulation with a feedback loop, so that you're doing a lot of so you're doing a steady state kinetics simulation, um, you know, and what if you don't want to bias yourself to an initial structure? This has the facility to take that basis state and apply some random transformation to it to generate your initial state. So, if you want to say reorient your binding partner before you start a simulation, you can do that. And the difference is the basis state is what you draw from before you do this random reorientation. And the initial state is what the simulation actually runs with when it kicks off a trajectory. So the basis states are the fixed things that you set up. What are the structures that I'm drawing from as a whole? The initial states are what weighted ensemble actually kicks your, your, your simulation off from, your simulation segments off from. In this case, we're just copying because we're starting from the same state without doing anything to it. We're just starting from this coiled structure. Um, and when Adam's talking about target states, um, it's in the WNet process where we set whether we are doing um, an equilibrium simulation or rather a relaxation simulation or a steady state feedback simulation. If you want to do a feedback simulation where when you reach a certain state, you kill off that walker and you move its weight back to the beginning and kick off a new simulation, you set that here by setting what are called the target states. So the lack of the target states arg arg argument, as Adam pointed out, is what makes this a non-recycling, a non-steady state simulation. Uh, so to help when you want to modify this to your heart's content. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> Next up is in RunSeg, which is in the folder uh, West for Scripts. Um, <clears throat> and I've, I've cut out, um, you can see there's little ellipse marks, which means I've, I've cut out parts to, to you know, make this a little clearer. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we've made a lot of changes to the script in order to run this on the local scratch, right? So in, in some of these tutorials, you're running, uh, like in the NACL Bromax tutorial, you just have... NACL and implicit solvent, that's just two little beads, right? You don't, that's, the dynamics are not particularly expensive, but in something like a P53 peptide fragment in explicit solvent, that's gonna be much more expensive. If you wanna run that on a supercomputing cluster or in, in scaling up, you're gonna wanna make changes for your local scratch, basically. So in, in the env.sh file, which I'm, I'm not covering here, um, <coughs> I've defined this variable just called use local scratch, and this is just kind of a, best practice thing, which just says whether or not we're using the space on the node to actually run our dynamics. So that's what most of these are for. So first off, um, <clears throat> when RunSeg actually starts, you have to create your directory structure to actually store your data inside of wherever you're running the simulation for. So first you go into your uh, West Sim root directory, and then you say, okay, make the directory for where I'm ultimately going to store all my trajectory data, regardless of whether or not I'm running in the local scratch or not, and then just go ahead and CD in, into there. If I'm using the local scratch, make the scratch directory, um, <clears throat> which is defined in your env.sh, so you have to know something about your supercomputer infrastructure, um, which is again defined in your env.sh, which that's what that's for, basically. Um, <clears throat> make the directory, um, and then change into that directory. And then we define this variable called stage in. And what stage in is for is, is stage in is how we're going to go ahead and literally stage in all of the files for uh, setting up the rest of the simulation. So if we're um, using the node, if we're using the local node storage, um, we need to copy all of our files into the local scratch. If we're not using the local scratch. If we're just running things on like the shared file system, we can just get away with sim linking to save storage space. Um, <clears throat> you can copy, but that's going to get really expensive. I would not do that. Adam, before you move on, could mm -hmm. you point out which variables are defined by the user and which variables are handed to the script by West? Uh, West current, pretty much anything with West is defined by West, uh, and anything without West, I have defined. <laughs> so. Um, <clears throat> And that's actually, that's true across the case, actually. I don't think I explicitly did that, but that's the case. So, right. So, um, West, current seg, West current seg data ref is obviously defined by that. Um, I think that's the only one defined here, actually. So, 
moving on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we want to try to be. Um, we want to try to clean up after ourselves. So rather than just deleting everything, we define a new function called cleanup because we don't want our local sysadmins to get angry at us, um, even though they, they probably will anyway because we'll make mistakes. So um, <clears throat> basically, we call when oops when our um, I didn't actually end up highlighting it, but there's what we call it. We just call this track cleanup exit. That means regardless of why our syst why our script actually exits, we call this function called cleanup. So if we end up using the local scratch, we copy everything of interest we may want back to our shared file space, which, this, depending on what your dynamics are, you're going to have to make that choice, right? So here I copy everything, um, <coughs> everything CPT, XTC, TRR, etc., 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 which in the case of Gromax, that's the checkpoint file, trajectory files, energy files, um, structures, logs, um, everything outputted by the... Um, uh, uh, analysis tools. I then um, remove everything else. I blow away the local scratch directory. <clears throat> Otherwise, I just go ahead and remove some files that I um, copied in in the next step. Okay. Now we actually initialize our run. So, if this is a continuation from a prior segment, I copy in everything. I stage in from my parent segment. I stage in my uh, structure file. I stage in my checkpoint file. So newer versions of Gromax is of like 4.5 or 4.6, so maybe not that new. Um, you're supposed to use checkpoint files to continue simulation. So that's what we do. That's the seg.cpt, which you can see right, uh, you can see right there. <coughs> um, and I also have this thing called imagedref.grow, which I then copy in as parent imaged.grow. Um, and then I also copy in everything from this folder called gmx.config, or gmx underscore config. That includes things like my force field files, my, I um, uh, can't think of the word, but, um, yes, topology, thank you. <laughs> my topology, everything involved with that, topology includes, etc. cetera. Um, and then I go ahead and I use grompp, which just creates my binary topology, which is necessary to run and drun with the uh, checkpoint file, which just means I'm continuing with that. The Gromax checkpoint file is preferable to running relative to using the older method, which uses like the energy file and the, the uh, TPR file, because it includes exact state information about the barostat and the thermostat. That's a little Gromax specific, but it's in here, so I'm saying it. So Adam, with all of these stage in mm -hmm. lines, right. you would just use them to include any input files that you need for your dynamics. Any engine. input files that so you need for your dynamics. Your structure engine. file, your topology file, right. <clears throat> everything that you would need to start your simulation. Precisely. Right. Exactly. Your standard simulation run. Right. Yeah. It's not too different from uh, any of the normal tutorials. But the only thing that's a little bit different than the other one is using this uh, imaged file here. And again, that's mm -hmm. for the continuation file. Mm -hmm. um, if we have a new trajectory. Um, it's a little bit different. And it's a little bit different because um, I'm pulling in from a slightly, um, starting the simulation from an older version of Gromax, which didn't output trajectory files. So uh, I don't have the checkpoint. I don't have the checkpoint file. So I'm just starting from uh, an energy, an energy file and a trajectory file, basically. But other than that, it's almost exactly the same. Um, in addition, I still have the. Um, there's this question of this. In later on in the analysis, I need this file called parentimaged.grow, which I'll explain about in a little bit. Obviously, if it's a new trajectory, it doesn't have a parent. It's a little orphaned, so I just need to make a, a judgment call. So I just pull in one file that's called parentimaged.grow, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. From this point on, it doesn't matter whether it's a new trajectory or a continuation. Um, <coughs> I have, a, I have, a, um, I have everything necessary to go ahead and run my dynamics. And I do that. So here's just, that's obviously very Gromax specific, but I call my uh, binary, which is MD run, that actually runs everything. And I have my TPR file, and all that just outputs everything, basically. Yes? Can I just emphasize that this looks exactly like you would run a Gromax group for the simulation? Right. This line here, there is. Except for maybe that. Yeah, except <laughs> you're only using one thread. One thread, basically. So, yeah. Yeah, so if, you, if you're, you know, 
weapon of choice is amber or something like that. It would, you know, you just sub those those commands in. It wouldn't be too different. <coughs> um, any questions so far? Yes. So, if how do you get the results, or how do you how do you after your trajectory segment ah. figure out which region you're in? Maybe that's a leading. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you should ask. So, <laughs> right. The next step is to um, <coughs> image and return the data. So. Uh, depending on what kind of analysis you're doing, right? So here we're doing, uh, the progress coordinate is the RMSD. So if, if you were doing something like just returning like the center of mass distance between two partners, with Gromax, uh, we wouldn't really have to worry about imaging actually, because the Gromax analysis tools for something like GDIST, I don't know if everybody's familiar with, probably we have a good distribution of people, but um, things like GDIST and other such tools are smart enough to handle periodic boundary conditions which um, <clears throat> I probably should have mentioned. But since this is an explicit solvent simulation, we do have periodic boundary conditions turned on, so we have to worry about those. Um, so we need, an, right, GDIST and other such tools are smart enough to handle the periodic boundary conditions. Um, GRMS and other tools which calculate the RMSD by design do not handle periodic boundary conditions, and so you must um, <clears throat> image the trajectory and account for them um, before you actually return the progress coordinate. And so there's a lot of documentation online regarding uh, how to do this with Gromax, and I see Max laughing. Um, there's, when you're splitting a trajectory into chunks like you're doing in like weighted ensemble, there's really only one particularly unique thing you have to worry about. Um, <clears throat> so I'll talk about that after I go into this. This is fairly standard. Um, it looks a little nasty, but it's not. In each of these, you can see there's this uh, command. So all we're doing here is saying, we're okay, command zero, and then we feed this command in to tragconf. And tragconf is the Gromax program, which actually just handles the imaging. So all we're doing here is we're saying, okay, we're just gonna image the whole system, right? We're just, we're not gonna do something fancy with the protein. We're just gonna take care of all the, we're gonna take care of the protein and the solvent, because maybe we wanna do something interesting with the solvent as well, in theory. And this, um, this procedure here from line 100 to 108 is generally good enough for almost any system. Um, you, could, you could take this and you wouldn't be, with some minor modifications, you wouldn't be too bad for anything. Um, <clears throat> the first step we do here is we use tragconf and we remove the periodic boundary conditions. So we pull in our seg.xtc, we reference it to parent image.grow, output none.xtc, pvc none. The next step is we pull in that none.xtc, references to parent image.grow. We make everything whole. So first we allow things to diffuse out of the box. Then we say, okay, if anything does actually fall out of the box, normally by default they'll get cut if they move out of the box. We stop them from getting cut and we just say, okay, now if, instead of getting cut, just jump across the box. Then we say, okay, actually don't jump across the box. Don't jump at all. Just go ahead and actually successfully diffuse out of the box. And then the last thing we do is we say, take the very last frame of the trajectory and create this imaged reference file. And the reason you have to do this is because if we don't supply this imaged reference file, right, if we just, so this is an optional flag to Gromax. If we just pull in this seg.xtc, by default, Gromax will reference the zeroth time point when it's doing this. Um, <clears throat> and if you, um, and it assumes that your imaging is correct at, the at time point zero. So if in the last iteration, our protein jumped out of the box, so it starts outside of the box during this iteration, it's going to assume that that's correct. So our RMSD is going to be artificially high during this iteration unless we supply a correctly imaged file for this. So if it did jump, so if it jumped out of the box during the last iteration, the last iteration's parent, this imaging procedure would have correctly put it back in the box. But if we don't pass in the correctly imaged file, the child isn't going to get that. So you'll see like an RMSD of like, maybe like you know, six or something like that. For this iteration, it'll jump to like maybe like 18 or something. So you'll see huge discontinuities in your progress coordinate and in your reference trajectory. By making sure you pass in this, this continuous chain of parent structures, 
that have been correctly imaged to avoid that problem. That's really the only the that's really the only correction you need to make to the kind of standard imaging procedure you'll see online that you have to take into account for weighted ensemble. Okay. After that, you're able to return your progress coordinate like normal. Um, <clears throat> and again, there's there's many ways you can do this, and here in particular, we're just going to return. So actually, I'm returning the auxiliary progress coordinate first here. So um, <clears throat> I'm using GDIST to return um, the end-to-end -end center of mass distance of the pept of the um, caps on the peptides. And so I'm using GDIST for that. And like I said, GDIST actually uh, correctly account, like, accounts for the periodic boundary condition. So it's okay that we're putting seg.xtc there. And so I put in seg.xtc, and I put in the uh, reference file, the TPR, and I output to disk.xvg. <clears throat> and I go ahead and I say, xvg none just says don't put any header information in the file. And I go ahead and I, this just converts to angstroms with awk. There's numerous ways to do this. <laughs> um, essentially, the, the important part is piping in, for an auxiliary progress coordinate, and I'll get to this in a minute, <clears throat> I've named it in west.config end-to-end dist with those underscores. And so the, uh, the environment variable is west, and then auxiliary coordinate name, underscore return, all in caps. That's a file? Yes, that's actually a file. So um, <clears throat> it's a file that's given to RunSeg that the server knows to look for, for and each individual segment. The coordinate or coordinates in that file. Yes, yeah. exactly. You're just the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Precisely. And the, ooh, ooh, that didn't. Okay, so that, for some reason, that slide doesn't work. So, um, <laughs> right. <clears throat> So um, in this case, right, so it, it's not going to be highlighted, but this next command actually returns the progress coordinate. Um, and so I'm changing the command, which is just actually return the actual progress coordinate. And then I use GRMS, and GRMS is sensitive to the periodic boundary conditions. So I'm putting in this no jump.xtc, which is the correctly imaged trajectory. And this outputs by default a file called rmsd.xvg, and I convert to angstroms because prefer working with angstroms, apparently. And then, um, by default, well, the, the correct variable is called west p chord return. Okay. Any questions so far? Oh, that's nasty. Yeah, I did that for one of my students. Yeah, I, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that one looks, that one looks very bad. Is everyone doing the green one? Huh? Go back to the green one. <laughs> <laughs> questions? Justin? What are the significance of the, just out of curiosity, what are the significance of the numbers you're putting in the um, that's, so those are commands, uh, right, so I was talking about these right here. Yeah. Um, these are commands that are specifically for GDIST and for GRMS. So I'm feeding in this, uh, you see this dash n, and then I give it this environment variable called ndx. So in env.sh, you will you can take a look and you can see that um, I've, like, I, have this bar, bleh, I have this variable called ndx, which is pointing to an index file by Gromax, which I've specified a bunch of index groups. And then um, <clears throat> the input to GDIST, when you run GDIST, it says, which groups do you want to actually run these calculations on? So group 18 and group 19 actually refer to the groups that I want to run this command for. Groups of? Uh, which in this case are the... The residues. The residues, yeah. So that refers to, yeah, those are the cap heads. The those, are, those are the atoms of the capping heads, exactly. And then... Uh, that's just the end line command. So that's basically 18 enter, 19 enter. So that's as if I was sitting at the terminal and typing exactly that in. So these are your indexes for calculating the end to end distance in your peptide. Precisely. Okay. Moving on, is there more questions? Not a lot of IO. There is, yes. Oh, no, no. <laughs> So this is efficient in the limit of your dynamics taking a long time to trim. Right. <laughs> uh, and if they don't, well, that's one of the long-term things. It's like, how do we figure out how to, how to do the I.O. load? Uh, solid state disks help a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not perfect. <laughs> or do you just mean, like, this kind of running on the, like, this kind of... Silly two slides back, that's crazy. I think with the 
reading in the whole system and writing out the whole system and you have to do that four or five times. Right? Yeah. So um, um, there's, is there's that a Gromax specific thing? This yeah. is this is kind of a Gromax specific thing. There are, there are ways. Yeah. Yes. One trajectory read. Yeah. Yeah. So I work with Charm, and it's just to set up one of my systems takes you know about uh, ten seconds. So yeah. having to do that, you know, yeah. over and over. Um, yeah. yeah. You wouldn't want to do that yeah. if your segments only took three seconds to run. Right. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, like the dynamics. I mean, the the dynamics on this take about um, ten minutes, uh, give or take. On like one of these segments, um, and this is this is why you want to run it on like the local scratch on the node. You don't want to be running these types of procedures. You don't want to be running dynamics across like the network infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be running imaging commands over the network infrastructure, right? It's just it's going to make a lot of people very angry with you very very quickly. Ah, look, they're so close. <laughs> it's a lot of code to stare at. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Right. Where does the data actually go? Okay. So I said we're using a custom uh, a custom progress coordinate loader, and I wasn't lying to you. So if you switch over to west.config, if you want to follow along at home, you can see that um, <clears throat> in truth, okay, uh, not much actually differentiates the progress coordinate from any other data set. It's not really treated that differently internally. Um, and in fact, you can kind of just treat it like a regular data set if you just go ahead and specify in data sets named keyboard enabled to true. I don't, I don't know what happened if you set that to false. I've never done that. But if you give it, <laughs> I, not sure I'd advise, you can try it, I guess. But if you just give it a loader, which um, <clears throat> you just give it any, any loader you feel like, um, we're going to get into, and yeah, we're, we'll get into what that means. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that exists. Um, <laughs> right? It's going to go ahead and use that instead of the internal loader, which is built in to, wait, to weighted ensemble, to WESPA. Um, and then again, we're actually returning this progress coordinate as well. Uh, we're not using a custom loader for this. By default, uh, if you don't specify something, it uses numpy.load text. We don't care to do any post-processing with this one. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that's fine. All right, so you said end to end disk here. End to end disk. Config, and that's right. how the west end to end disk. Exactly. Yes. That's how that gets decided right there. So you can name it something, you can name it anything you want, and that's what you have to name it there. You can name it something unseemly if you wish, and that's fine. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> as well, uh, right, so there are some new pcord options. So if you, um, if you clone WESPA from GitHub, these won't be there, but if you uh, pull a fresh copy of the West Tools repo um, directly there and go ahead and, and set everything up, this will be there. So um, <clears throat> there have been some new options placed into west.config to set up some of the binning options there. And um, the modules that are available, that are being loaded on Frank do actually use this correct, do use this. So some of the, uh, you don't have to know as much Python, or any Python, actually, in order to use this. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of a, you, it's a hybrid, essentially. So you, and in fact, here, we're using both. So some of the binning options are being set in system.py, and some of the binning options are being set in west.config. And the reason why is because um, I wanted to use slightly more uh, advanced options. So I want to use some of the built-in Python or NumPy um, <clears throat> list comprehension. So I, I didn't set all of the bin parameters there, but here I did set some of the things. So inside of um, West system driver, um, I went ahead and set, um, <clears throat> right. So you can set the number of dimensions, you can set the pcord length, you can set the pcord data type, and you can set the bin target counts. and I'm not showing it here, but there are a bunch of commented outlines which also show you uh, that you can set the bins there. And if you don't set the bins in west.config in this option, um, it looks to system.py for the bins. Um, again, by default, it's going to pull from west.config. If it doesn't find it there, it'll pull from system.py. And it is actually easier to set this here. There's, I, I found it actually quite, quite easy and um, just cleaner in general. <coughs> Just one thing. Mm -hmm. um, the loading 
sequence is actually system five first, and then this oh, the second. It's live to everybody? That's, that's it. Oh, good. I lied to everybody. Okay, never mind. I had, so it, I had it backwards. You can, you, if you set it in system, you can overwrite it here if you prefer. Okay. But if you just don't overwrite it, it just goes through. Okay. Basically, you don't have to set anything in the system that system either, by the way. Okay. It doesn't have to be there at all. You can actually set it in from here. Okay. Okay. Um, and I think we've already covered that you can change um, the number of dimensions. Well, we we've talked about actually changing the um, the number of bins on the fly. We actually haven't talked about that you can change the number of dimensions on the fly. But just as you can change uh, how everything's been, you can you can change the number of dimensions on the fly. And in and fact, when you say on the fly, you mean you stop it, change it, and restart, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That. Sorry. That's. that's yes. That's sorry. Kind okay. of it's like that look you were giving me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. You can, yeah. You don't have to. You don't have to reinitialize. Yeah, you don't have to throw away. You don't have to throw away your data. Right. Yeah. Sorry. I should be should be more careful. Um, and in fact, I think for um, I think for the, the, the data you're going to see later, um, I probably should have I probably should have gone ahead and, and um, well, I'll get into that in a second. But <clears throat> so here's um, again. So we have a two dimensional right. We have a two dimensional uh, progress coordinate. But obviously, I was only returning one data set in the run seg. So um, this little progress coordinate loader obviously has to come up with the other dimension. And indeed, it will. So um, <clears throat> in the uh, system.py, I have the bin boundary set up. And that's in the initialization function. In particular, I wanted to stick with these x ranges. Um, now, I wasn't sure about what kinds of um, range that this peptide was going to explore when I initially ran it. Um, in hindsight, I may have been able to pick better bins. Um, that's almost always the case, um, as you'll see later. But these are the bins I started with, and these are the bins I ran with, and they, they did indeed explore space out to about 8 RMSD. So, um, <clears throat> right, there they are, as you can see. Um, so that's one particular dimension. So I just go ahead and set this Python list up. Um, and then I have what's called self.color bin bounds. And the way I'm doing state tracking is um, I essentially just later on I define a color tracker which applies, um, which defines a state as, as an integer value, as 0 or 1. Or if there's an unknown state, which there isn't in this case, it'll be 2. And you can define as many states as you wish and you just apply these these bin boundaries, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and I found it more convenient to, to not quite bin on the actual um, integer values. I just binned in between them. And then, um, right, so there's some questions earlier about how to do the actual two-dimensional progress coordinate. So I have the, here are the lists that apply, the lists that are the actual uh, bins. And then in the rectilinear bin mapper, I just go ahead and do little comma between the two inside of a list. And now here's kind of, inside of system.py, here's kind of the meat of it. <clears throat> here's the custom P chord loader. So uh, in some of the other examples, there's, uh, what, there's a function called, I think, chord loader, which I think um, Carl wrote, uh, or, so, or somebody wrote. I'm not sure who wrote it, actually. Um, and this isn't too different from that, actually. Again, like I mentioned, the, the progress coordinate isn't really treated that differently. All of these functions follow kind of the same form. They have these four uh, inputs they take, field name, chord file, segment, and single point. And at the end of the day, they have to write something to segment and field name. But the only difference between um, something that's going to write to the progress coordinate versus something that's going to write to some arbitrary data set is you can write to segment.pchord directly as opposed to writing to segment and then writing to some uh, field name for something. So the entire point of this, uh, this custom progress coordinate loader is that we're going to load up the progress coordinate. We're going to check to see what state that our uh, walker is in, that our trajectory walker is in. And then we're going to apply a state tag, if necessary, um, and then return the progress coordinate with the appropriate state tag and uh, RMSD information. <clears throat> um, what I'm going to show here is... This loads up uh, one dimension from runseg.sh, and then it returns a two-dimensional progress coordinate. The actual, the example, so I've, I've commented out, I've taken out a bunch of lines. 
But the example that's in the actual GitHub repo has a couple lines commented out that you could easily uncomment out and switch it to be um, a multiple dimension, a multiple dimensional progress coordinate loader. So that if you had a two dimensional, if you were returning um, two dimensions in your run seg.sh, so if you were binning along both RMSD and the end-to-end -end distance, you could easily then apply this color tag and, and do that. So um, <clears throat> first you use numpy.loadText to load up the raw coordinates. And then you define what your um, color bins were actually going to be for the, um, uh, for the states, right? Um, and actually, um, after running the simulation, uh, I made a really bad guess as to what uh, space it was going to explore in terms of in terms of the RMSD. I thought maybe maybe a good state would be zero to t zero to two for like the coil in its folded state, and maybe fifteen and on would be all right. Five minutes, okay. Maybe fifteen and on would be good for that, and it was it was really bad, so it didn't explore that at all. But <clears throat> anyway, um, you have to take into account whether it's um, Single point, if single point is true, that just says whether you're in, if this is a new trajectory or not. Um, <clears throat> you have to take that into account. And that's all this does, basically. Every time it's initialized, if it's a new trajectory, you just set it, it has one point. Otherwise, it just, um, it's the full length of the progress coordinate. This just initializes your, um, this just initializes the uh, raw RMSD coordinates or the colors. Nothing too special there. If this is a new trajectory, you just say, okay, initially we don't know what state we're in. Um, we then go ahead and say, okay, we don't know what state we're in. We're going to check to see if we're actually in a state. If we're in a state at the beginning of our trajectory, we assign a state. If we're not in a state, we remain in the unknown state. <clears throat> if, we're, um, if this isn't a new trajectory, we just say, okay, our state is whatever state we started in. Nothing too special there. We then go to the very end of our um, state, because we're only going to define states at the end of the trajectory and say, okay, if we're in a state at the end of the trajectory, update the state. Otherwise, do nothing. The only other difference that there is is um, if it's a new trajectory versus whether um, it's a continue, whether it's, uh, sorry, if it's the beginning of a trajectory versus whether it's um, the full trajectory, the data has to be shaped differently, and so this takes that into account. So there's a little bit of funniness with how you actually return the little bit of nastiness here, basically. So we write out to segment.pcorp some funny with like numpy.h stack, and then if it's a longer, the data has to be shaped differently, which there's probably a cleaner way to do this, but that was kind of, that's what worked, basically. That's it. Okay, I, I really got lost. Okay. Um, why is that a special case? <clears throat> why is it everything so different? Or? Essentially, when you um, when you so uh, basically when you run like get peak, when you initialize a simulation, um, something like get p chord is called. So um, you need to determine when uh, you need to determine where a walker is when you first initialize it. Uh -huh. um, so this function will be called right because you need to it needs to run through the exact same uh, needs to run through the exact same pipeline, but you only have one time point for those. So, like, that's what this single you point is. Any, you don't even have a trajectory, you just have a starting? Right, that's exactly what it is. So, any, any type of, um, anything that's going to handle these, anything that's going to handle this progress coordinate needs to say whether, it needs to take into account whether it's going to be a single point or not, basically. So, the data has to be shaped just a little bit differently. And that's what, oops, that's what, that's what that is. Am I, miss, am I missing another case on that, or is that? So single point is true when you are using this function to ask the question of the starting point of the simulation. There's only one time point. There's no, there's no trajectory yet. It's just where you're starting. So when you're starting a simulation, you have, you have to decide, okay, how many walkers is it going to start in my initial state? And, but you don't, you don't know where you are until you calculate your progress coordinate. Right, so it's all coming from the text file where you wrote that progress coordinate, right? Um, uh, in this 
this case, yes. Yeah. There's some machinery there. This is what I was referring to earlier. If you want to take a, if you want to take one of these initial structures and perform some transformation on it before you actually use it to kick off the simulation, um, who knows what the output of that transformation is, particularly if you're doing some random reorientation of your mm -hmm. binary partners. So the output of that then comes into this with single point sets. So yeah, this is this is for doing some pretty sophisticated um, steady state simulation type things. Um, for most people, most of the time, single point is not going to be true. It's right. going to be very different from what you started with, and you're going to run on through calculating what is my progress coordinate for every time point right. along along that trajectory. But you have to take it into account if you use a function like this or write one like this. Generally speaking, I mean, um, this little block of code here, uh, or if you go to a higher, if you go to a higher dimensionality, like the comments in that file, you can basically just uncomment them and it'll work. <laughs> you only need to do this if you want to calculate your progress coordinate in a way that is more convenient for you to do it by this mechanism mm -hmm. than using the standard Amber or Chromax tool or whatever right. you have at your disposal. Right. Um, so none of this is Required. Right, but it's for the colors. You can also, I mean, you could do, yeah. you could, yeah, this, this works for the colors. You can also do more complicated analysis with this inside of Python as, as well. If you, you want to skip. The, yeah, you yeah. could do the colors. Yeah. I think you could do the colors. You could do the colors inside of, it. yeah. You could inside do, your favorite analysis. Inside tool. of your favorite yeah. analysis tool yeah. as well, yeah. There's, there's no reason that you have to do it inside of Python. But the color requires a knowledge of history. Right. So you could you could in theory um, there's state. Yeah, you could in theory like much like how I passed back and forth. I passed that like parent imaged file. You could basically just pass back and forth a file that contained state information as well. If you had some way to calculate that inside of runseg.sh. So it's, this certainly isn't the only way. This is the way that I found most convenient, and I feel that it illustrates um, some of the adaptability of of Westpa in particular. Being able to like you know you're not you know certainly you have to run the dynamics inside of runseg, but you're not stuck with analyzing everything inside of run seg. Any other questions?